Thank you for joining us today. I will be moderating today's session and William Ellis will be our presenter. We are going to try to keep the length to about 20 minutes plus some time for questions. Feel free to type any questions in the chat box during the session and we can try and address them as we go or at the end. The webinar is being recorded and we will send you a link afterwards so you can view anything you miss or to pass it along to someone who might benefit from listening. Our session today has three sections. The first is an overview of current market yields available to investors. The second details current opportunities in the marketplace you can take advantage of now. And finally, the last section, the life bull trail, which will cover off how to prepare for a sharp drop in the market. So on your screens, you will see a very famous quote from Macbeth. Fair is foul and foul is fair. William, you first mentioned this in our newsletter last month. What do you mean by that? Well, Matt, fair is foul means that what is perceived as safe is fair. But it's actually risky or foul right now. OK, now how can that be? Well, especially at this point in time, with all the concern about the economy and governments around the world, bonds are perceived as safe. On the other hand, stocks are perceived as risky. And there's a very high demand for the safety of bonds and to avoid those risky stocks. So we believe that the so-called safe investments are now risky because they're priced so high, they're priced high enough that they're risky. And whereas risky investments can be safe if they're priced low enough. Okay, well no, that makes more sense. And now on your screens, you'll see a chart on the estimated market yields. William, can you explain what we're seeing in this chart? Well, these are estimated market yields. These are the current yields the market is rewarding us with. They're an objective, non-biased measure of what cash flow is available in the marketplace right now from various investments. On the top, uh, there's a note of uh, what inflation is. And we recently reduced the level of inflation from 2 to 3 percent down to 1 to 2 percent because we've seen a little bit lower inflation right now. Uh, but I think the big story here is that uh, you know, drawing that fair is foul, uh, the fair investments of cash and bonds, if we look at those for a little bit here, you'll notice they're in the two to one to two percent range. And I have three data points here. Three month Government of Canada Treasury bills yield right now 99 basis points. Ten year bonds yield 1.77 percent and 30 year bonds, 30 years, yields 2.36%. Now these uh, low yields are a byproduct of the enormous demand for certainty that bonds provide. And as a result, investors are preparing to earn 2.36% uh, a year. Now think about that for a minute. Ask yourself, does it make sense to commit to an investment that will yield you, reward you, 2.36% a year for the next 30 years. The risk of owning a bond that yields so low of 2.36% is that after income taxes, you're left with about 1.5. And I don't think that that yield is sufficient to cover off inflation. Over the next 30 years, um, what will inflation be? The past few years, inflation's been 2 or 3%. And I think that inflation is likely to be at least that over the next 30 years. In fact, with governments coping with high deficits and, in, and high debts, there's a risk it'll be much higher because there's really only three ways for governments to cope with deficits and high debts. Raise taxes, cut entitlement spending, or devalue the currency through inflation. And inflation is particularly unkind to bondholders. So the only way that 30-year bonds yielding 2.36% works out well for investors is if prices were to fall over the next 30 years. Now that is possible. It's possible that we could have 
deflation over 30 years. But I don't think it's very likely because central banks are using every lever at their disposal to reinflate the economy. Now, are there assets with more attractive yields? Uh, yes, yes, there are, but not the assets that people perceive as being safe or fair. Um, below bonds there, you'll notice residential real estate. That's Canadian residential real estate. That's perceived by people as being safe. Uh, people have done very well on it over the last 10 or 12 years. And you'll notice that the yield for Canadian real estate is around 3 to 4 percent. And if anyone wants the math explained uh, behind that 3 to 4 percent yield, I'll, I'll go over it in the Q&A. So where are the yields attractive? Well, this is where foul is now fair, right? What is perceived as being risky and is being avoided is well-priced and provides a very attractive rate of return. In other words, safe investments are now so expensive that they're, so, that they're risky. You know, owning that 30-year bond to pay 2.36% a year before tax is risky because I don't know what I'll be able to purchase with the money when the bond matures in 30 years. Even with a modest in, uh, inflation, the haircut could be shocking. But on that flip side, what's attractive is investors are so afraid of select risky assets that they're priced attractively. And so two of them are highlighted here, the dividend portfolio and the, and the uh, growth portfolio. The free cash flow on our dividend portfolio right now is just under 8% a year. And uh, just over half of that free cash flow that those businesses earn within the business is being paid out in dividends, an attractive rate of return. And select growth businesses uh, are really being punished even further because they pay very little in dividends, but they're priced to yield right now 10 plus percent. Very attractive. So moving on to current opportunities in the market, can you go over the opportunities available to investors right now? Well, I guess there's three of them here noted on the slide. The first one is this dividend portfolio we just talked about. Um, this is the core investment that we use. Um, free cash flow of just under 8%, half of it or more paid out in dividends. Um, three reasons why we like to own these businesses. First, for a decent yield, a yield which is growing faster than the rate of inflation. Last year in 2011, the dividends were increased um, by 7%, okay, overall dividend increase uh, for the whole portfolio. Well, inflation growing at, say, 2%, you know, you're getting quite a bit of a real pay increase there within the portfolio. Over time, that's attractive. And this year as well, 2012, uh, there have been uh, more dividend increases than companies in the portfolio and the increase has been a little less than seven but still very healthy and we're, there's still more uh, months left in the year to uh, get some more dividend increases we hope uh, and we expect more next year so that's the first thing decent cash flow from this dividend portfolio second thing is it's generally more stable than the market so that when markets sell off it retains it val its value better that makes us be comfortable but it also sets us up for the third benefit, which is it allows us to be nimble, to be able to take advantage of sell-offs and use some of that money in the portfolio, perhaps selling off a few of the companies that have done very well and reallocate the, the capital to what has been really hurt and that is extremely attractive. That's our dividend portfolio. Attractive right now and it's managed and positioned to do well and weather the storm uh, if we get some rough markets. The growth, growth portfolio, we had a seminar in October on this um, and a quick uh, recap there. We find that the Canadian dollar here which is at par or above is historically very good. It's very strong right now and we like to use our Canadian dollars especially at this level to purchase uh, uh, foreign currency assets. Okay, we think it's a good time to do that. We also have select companies out there where we see free cash flow yields north of 10%, where those yields, like those dividends in the dividend portfolio, 
the yields on these companies are growing at a very decent clip, north of 7% a year. And they're growing, and we expect them to grow um, despite what happens within the economy. Okay, these types of business are less economically sensitive. So we think that's very attractive. And the third one mentioned there is U.S. real estate. We have a presentation next week on the 20th. You can RSVP to Matt. This is for a seminar for accredited investors, and it's uh, the opportunity in U.S. real estate. Okay, so there is a real um, dichotomy between what's happened with Canadian real estate and what's happened in the U.S. And we think that right now using the strong Canadian dollar to buy the uh, very weak U.S. real estate uh, is very good. So whereas the previous slide showed that the free cash flow yield from owning Canadian residential real estate is 3 to 4%, the unlevered return of buying property in the States is in the range of 7-8%. And you can borrow 30-year money at 3 and 4%. So if you lever that um, 7 or 8% up, you get a very attractive double-digit return. And that's before considering any capital gain in the underlying asset, which we think we might enjoy in coming years, even if we don't. To get a double-digit free cash flow yield return, albeit levered, but conservatively levered for real estate, is very attractive. So looking at this slide, What's the likelihood, in your opinion, of seeing a drop such as 10, 15, or 20 percent in the market? Well, you know, I don't want people to be misled here that I'm not here predicting that a drop is in, imminent because as I just, uh, you know, went over, the, the opportunities are very attractive right now. However, if we look back in 2010, 11, and 12, we've had some sell-offs. In 2012, the year we're in right now, in the summer we had a 10% peak to trough sell-off in the market. In 2011, we had a 20% peak to trough sell-off in the market. 2010, it was somewhere between 10 and 15%, so don't quote me, but we had a big sell-off again in that year. So in the last three years, we've had three sell-offs. Sell-offs are inevitable. Um, you know, and, and, and so they are part of investing. And as you said, you can't predict the timing or even be sure that it will happen, but what do you do to be prepared for such a scenario? Well, you know, at, at, at the core of it, we first of all, we manage the dividend portfolio uh, conservatively, and we focus on the free cash flow yields, and we focus on owning businesses where we think the dividends will be increasing at a nice clip faster than inflation. And if we continue to own those types of businesses that are growing their earnings, growing their dividends, the markets may sell off. Our companies may be uh, affected by that. We don't believe by the same degree. But we expect over time they, the, the companies will increase in value and will earn our dividend. And the, these, these, these market corrections will not hurt us in the portfolio. But we're also in this portfolio nimble. And the old uh, adage is to buy low, sell high. And so over the last year, we have been trimming profit in individual companies where we have done very well and had capital appreciation well at uh, very, you know, very good capital appreciation on top of the, the dividends we received because these companies now are more expensive. So we've trimmed the profit. That's given us capital to be prepared in case we do get a market correction. And being nimble in the dividend portfolio also means that we recognize opportunities outside of the dividend portfolio. Those available right now, such as in global opportunities and U.S. real estate opportunities. And so we're introducing those to client portfolios. But above all, you know, we, we need to, every individual, every family is different. So we have to do what's right for you and your family, taking into account how far you are away from retirement, whether you're in retirement, 
how much risk you're comfortable with, how much cash flow you need, whether you have available cash flow to add to the portfolio today or in the future. All of those things we sit down and we prepare on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And finally, what can our team and our clients do together to be prepared in the event of a sharp drop in the market? So this is what you're calling the lifeboat drill. Okay, well thank you. Um, and I guess I got started at down this road here by, by talking about meeting to figure out one-on-one -on -one what strategies. So I guess it starts with asking the question, what if? And there are a lot of what ifs out there. What if this happens? How is that going to impact, impact you? How do we need to prepare? And just this lifeboat drill, giving you a little bit of background, um, you know, if you go on a cruise, it's a requirement of, of the... Uh, maritime law, I think. Mar is. Maritime law, right? It's a requirement that you have a lifeboat drill. So on the first day, you, you put on your, um, your life preservers. They're in your cabin. You put them on. You go out on deck generally, and you stand beside your assigned lifeboat so that you know that if we get rough seas, if we need to, we know where to go, and we're not going to panic. And so the purpose of this call, being called the lifeboat drill, is to get us thinking about that. And, you know, it, it comes down to, in my family, we eat bananas. And uh, we eat a lot of them. And we, we will buy them every week. And they're generally 79 cents a pound. And we'll buy so many bananas. But every now and then they decrease the price to 69, 59. Even I've, I've been at one store, 39 cents a pound. Well, we load up. And uh, we do that for other, other types of... Uh, articles as well. But in general, most people who are investors don't do that. They don't think about it that way. And so this lifeboat drill, the purpose of this is to start thinking about how do we prepare? Okay, We've done in the past, I think, a good job of preparing clients. We don't have clients jumping off the boat very frequently when the markets get choppy. They stay on the boat. They stick with the program, and they end up doing quite well. But I think where we need to improve, and part of the point of the call is, we believe that markets are attractively priced today, and we wouldn't hesitate to add capital at this level. But if we get a level that's a level below this, we want to ask the questions, what steps can we take individually in our families to take advantage of that. And that may mean adding additional funds to the portfolios at an opportunity, uh, opportune time, I guess buying low. Well, there's no questions in the chat, but William, I know you've been introducing this to clients. How would you say the reception's been? Well, we've started to do that in the last month or so, and we're getting a good reception. And, um, I think people get it. The concept, you know, because it's not an emotional discussion. It's a discussion of where are you in terms of your financial dashboard? Where are you in terms of your goals? What is your cash flow looking like that you need out of the portfolio if you're close to retirement or um, in retirement? What is the cash flow in your life in terms of uh, savings, in terms of perhaps bonus or, or other funds coming due? And what is earmarked? What's the plan? And what if we had an opportunity presented to us where the market did sell off 10, 15, 20%? We think the opportunity is great today and we wouldn't hesitate to invest. But if it gets even better, then maybe we will need to look at pre-buying, just as I do with those bananas where I might buy some extras. Or if I have a jar of tomato sauce uh, in the fall, sometimes they go on sale, I'll buy a, a case of 12, a 24, ahead of time at lower prices because it's the best time to buy it, right? I think we want to look at that for our clients as well. 
Well, if there's no further questions, thank you for joining us today. And if you'd like to learn more about today's webinar, please feel free to contact us at 416-969-3190. Thank you, and I will now be ending the session. Thank you.